Hello, welcome to Quark Talk. I'm Crystal here on Tuesday morning. So we have a pretty heavy topic today, sex trafficking, but we have a very interesting and creative way to dive into this topic. Why so? Because I've met this very, very cool guy who actually is a writer, director, producer, you know, visioneer, who based on his true experience as a soldier has catapulted him into the creative world to translate these experiences and, and perspectives on it. So with no further ado, please welcome my cool new buddy, Braden, Braden Yoder. Welcome. Well, thanks for that introduction. Crystal. Well, you know, what am I going to say? Oh, I just met this dude who... Actually, I should share that we shared the Producers Lab at the Creative uh, Lab Hawaii a couple of weeks ago, was it? Yeah. Just yeah, 20 through the 24. Yeah. A very intense workshop on our creative projects, and I think that was really cool. And I learned a lot about Brayden and being a local boy, but having gone to Iraq and then spending time in India for the sex trafficking um, story and then moving to L.A., you're just a worldly guy who has a perspective that maybe a lot of people don't really come close to. So we'll start with trauma. I know it's a heavy one, but that's what kind of started your path into exploring these subjects. Why so? Well, as you said, I was a soldier. Yeah. And when I left uh, the military, I needed to find a way to, to get over what I experienced in Iraq and um, try to turn that into a positive. And then that eventually led me to a writing degree, which turned out to be very therapeutic. I didn't realize that it would have that those benefits actually I just thought well what am I going to do now I'm not going to be in the army anymore how long were you in the army for uh, four and a half years but before that you know it was four years of college too so I was doing ROTC so oh, okay. you know for eight eight and a half years of my life that was my identity and it 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 changed you know obviously when I decided I was going to leave and I wasn't going to to uh, to continue on in the military after Iraq so I thought, well, you know, I'd always been a good writer in, in high school, and I never took it seriously, but, okay, let's, let's go and see about that. And it had the added benefit of, as I said, being very therapeutic. So I'm okay. a big believer now in people needing to find an outlet yes. to, to, Absolutely. to process their experiences, whether it's just someone listening to you or, or finding a way to turn it into something creative. I think it's very important because we all have a story to tell, and we want people that, you know, the story doesn't exist unless someone's willing to listen to it. So... You find a way to, to get it out, and um, there's there's benefits uh, to that, and that that led me uh, ultimately led, led me to India. Was there any big story when you were in Iraq that triggered your creative side, or? Um, I think just well, my writing started you know when I left because I was trying to make pro make sense of it all. But when I was there, I was I was obviously asking questions. I was emailing back home about the occupation and, and what we were doing there some things that were going well and other things that that weren't so just asking those kind of questions but when you're in it you can't really yes do that you know it's yeah, like yeah. being in a, in a relationship or being in something where you know it's only when you get out of it that you can, you can sort of have that perspective so I moved to Australia because obviously I need to be an English-speaking country um, and when I was in Australia I did my creative writing degree and that's when I was able to process all of these Okay, these so things. why did you choose India? You I stayed had, there for several years. I did. Well, so just getting out of my comfort zone, going to Sydney, um, I met friends from India who ah. told me about this National Film School of India. And at that time, India was sort of taking off in the public consciousness. Like Time Magazine had put a, uh, India Indian woman on the cover, I think in 2006 or 2007, it was like India Incorporated, talking about Bollywood and, and things that were just really interesting. So having that personal connection with different friends uh, from India who were there in Sydney, and then just it kind of being interesting in the public consciousness, and then just being interested in Asia in general, hmm. I was like, okay, let me go check this out. So why sex trafficking? I mean, is it something to do with the trauma kind of concept from when you were a soldier? No, I, I really kind of stumbled into that. Really? Um, I, you know, the first rule of writing is to write from what you know. Right. And so when I got to India and I realized, okay, I'm going to be here for a long time. I need to find a story that I can access. And I didn't know what it was, so I just started to engage in the community. Okay. Um, because obviously all my... my uh, friends at the film school were also were already Indian, so they already knew what story they were going to tell. Okay. You know, for me, the only story I could tell at that point was someone who had come to India, right? So I needed to spend some time in the community, and I ended up linking up with a friend. She had come to do her master's in um, social work, I believe, uh -huh. and she was studying sex trafficking. Okay. And she was only going to be there for a couple of months, and through her, I said, well, let me go and, and, and tag along, and through her, I... Uh, got access to this organization, Sahaley. Which but this is a crazy club. world, right? Sex trafficking. I mean, did you have a preconception of... I had no idea. And I had no <laughs> idea it happens in this country. You know, I mean, that's how naive exactly. 
And I think you know now in the press, it's, people are catching on to this more. I've been seeing more and more articles about this in the LA Times, New York Times, and things like that. But um, I had no idea. This was 2008, so this was January 2008, and so this was even a year and a half before that book, Half the Sky, was published, mm. which, which did talk about sex trafficking through Asia. And of course, I was very naive. You know, I went down to this uh, uh, sex workers collective in the middle of the red light district in Pune. And did they think you were a potential customer? Honestly? Um, I mean, no, I don't think. I mean, cause, because again, I went with my friend Enos, oh, okay, and then okay. and I had access to the uh, um, to the administration of the uh, okay, of, of the, right. gr the group. The collective, what they did was they advocated for for rights for for sex workers that weren't there for these quote unquote fallen women. What does that mean, like rights? Um, rights such as being able to, um, so one of the services they provide, for example, and the, and the way I, I first got involved was they ran a, a creche, a nursery, for the children of right. sex workers, which, you know, if, you, if you've seen Born into Brothels, I mean, the, the children can either stay in the brothels and they can hide underneath the bed, or they can f find a place to, to go. And that's what Saheli did. They, they provided a, a nursery for these kids, and I just fell in love with these kids. So I would yeah. go there once a week and play with them. But the other services they provided was like a, um, a bank, for yeah. example. So that way when a woman can no longer perform can this work, themselves. yeah, it, almost like microfinance in that sense, just that they could set some money aside yeah. and then they could you know, invest it and do things with it um, in, in a way that they couldn't. Uh, in polite society. I want to go back to you being um, involved with the kids at the, I think we have a photo actually of you hanging out with a bunch of boys there. Are they mostly boys? Well, no, they're no, boys and boys girls. Boys and girls, but th their hair was cut so short oh, okay. uh, because of the, the ukus, the, the lice. So like you didn't want it to, you know, to jump around. So. Okay, but for me, that's the most um, shocking repercussion of trafficking that people don't tend to see. They always think, okay, the victim, the woman, and what's going to happen to her, but they don't think, oh my God, there's a whole other generation of offsprings from these victims, or with, and, and, and what do people do with them, and how are they are treated when they grow up? So was that like a big opening, eye-opening area? Well, what know? was really eye-opening was how much the mothers cared for their children, and that was something I, I didn't expect. And huh. in, in some cases, um, these women that we interviewed. So, you know, Enos, my friend, she was doing interviews into this. And so I got to be privy to some of those interviews. And that's the link for me, was the trauma that they had experienced and the fact that someone was asking them, was giving them that outlet. They were able to talk about this trauma of leaving their home, of being kidnapped or being uh, tricked into this life. Um, I recognized in their need to tell the story, the same need that I had to tell my story after coming back from Iraq. And what was really interesting was to find out, I didn't expect that they would love their children, you know, that these were bastard children, right? right? right. And yet, in many cases, these children gave them the strength to survive. Huh. They weren't just focused on themselves anymore and their own pity of what happened to them. They made their peace with it, and they were able to focus on their children, and I want to make sure my kid has a better life. Right. Uh, which, which just blew me away, you know. I, 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 and again, not knowing anything about the culture, my first question was, well, why don't they just go home? You know, I mean, I, I was there in the red light. I could see that you could just leave at any time, but of course, you can't. You can't really, you know. And but in some cases, the the women did go home, and the parents wouldn't take them back. Right. To find out about the the whole save the girl child campaign in India, the idea that the, the, a girl child is a burden to the, the village, no matter what had happened to this woman that got her into this life. In some cases, she was married off, and then it turns out that her husband's mom was a, a, a sex trafficker, right? right? And, right. So, and, so then, and then turned around and, and drugged, drugged the, the, the girl, sold her into slavery somewhere else in, in the country. Um, and it's, it's a tough topic to talk about. And obviously, um, people in India, when I did my documentary there, uh, the, the organization was very, very uh, excited about it because they had something that they could promote themselves. But yes. other people were not very happy that I was looking in, into this. You know? Okay, sure, because right. there are a lot of bad guys out there who are trying to control this whole industry, Well, well right? I think also just culturally, um, the you idea don't talk that... talk about it. Well, that and just the idea that, oh, how's a foreigner going to look into this um, in, in, a, in a superior sort of position, which, which is not what I was, I was doing. I've been working there for three years. I wanted to tell the story there. But then that led me to kind of think, wow, well, we have this going on in our country, too. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And obviously in Hawaii, it happens quite a bit as well. Um, so it's just become a, an interest and, and a passion, and I never... Like I said, I never expected to, to right. go there. So um, I was going to ask you is how, how did they treat you if you were an outsider? And you're also a man. And usually their world is so protected within themselves. 
that how, how did they open up to you or did they not and it, it just through, took time you know it okay. was it was you know probably two two to three years of coming, were they curious about you that. did they learn about you and was it a reciprocal relationship well not I wouldn't say I, I developed any um, relationships with the with the women who were actually working in the red light who, the people I deliver, uh, um, built relationships with were the ones who were working at Saheli, advocating for sex workers' right. rights. So some of them were social workers, Indian social workers. Some of them, the Thai, which mean, which in that uh, language meant sister, they were retired sex workers they, who were now trying to advocate for, for safe sex and other, other uh, precautions that these women could take so they wouldn't be um, at the mercy of, of, of the Johns. Those are the people that I really formed Did relationships with. Did you try with. to understand why the culture is the way it is when, and how they treat the women? coming from a Western perspective? I, I, I did, and it's, it's, it's tough to talk about in the sense that I don't, you know, we have our own issues too, and you don't want to Absolutely. be, you know, judge, like I was saying, you don't want to be judgmental. But it seemed that the, from all the reading that I've done, there's the Madonna and, and the whore complex, where a, a woman can either be this very chaste and pious right. person, or she can be um, huh. the, the, the fallen woman. But the idea of, of having a, a, a normal sex life uh, and enjoying that was not there um, it, it, as much, and and so, and but which is really interesting because this is the land of the Kama Sutra and all of that. But <laughs> right, but but that was what came back from all of the things I I read about sex trafficking and and uh, the, the attitude when I was mm. there, um, and you know that was that was very interesting. So some of the the women that we interviewed talked about. Some of the men were just lonely, and they wanted to just talk. They felt very lonely in their marriage, and, and they actually paid the women. And, and these women were very canny, so they, they knew how to, to provide that outlet for the, for the man rather than providing any sort of services for That sounds for like him. something that's relevant here, too, yeah? I mean, for a sex worker in, in the West. I think you'll do whatever you, know, you, do whatever you can to survive. Yeah. And, um, you know, it just oh, opened my eyes. I have all the respect in the world for these women that are working in, at Saheli to, um, and, and, and a couple of men that were there too, social workers, but mm -hmm. trying to advocate for better rights for, uh, for this red light district, for the women of this red light district. Uh, it was very you know, eye-opening and inspiring yeah. for me. To, I mean, how does that change you as a person? You've already been changed by being in Iraq and seeing life death situations, and then you, get, you throw yourself into the red light district in India, and, and you see this. Oh, it made me a much better person, I think, because, you know, um, everybody's got a story, but there's always someone out there who's got it worse than you, you know, and to have that perspective and to learn about another culture in, in a very, you know, um, raw way was, was, was very, uh, I don't know, inspiring for me. It made me, it made me a much better person. It made me, you know. Do you feel the need to use that inspiration and that knowledge into your creative work? I mean, not to just, you know, spell it out and try to educate people in a hard sense, but do you want that underlying yeah, I do. I, I do. I think for me, you know, going to Iraq and having this clash of cultures yeah. um, in, a, in a negative way, um, to be able to turn that on its head and have a, a clash of cultures in a positive way, you know, by engaging uh, is something that I'm much more interested in. I'm much more interested in building bridges than, um, than walls. Can you, so. Okay, so speaking of bridge, what do you think the similarities of trauma, let's say, from a soldier's point of view is with the trauma experienced by a sex trafficked woman? You know, it's really hard for me to speak to that, right? Um, but from what you see or felt during that time. Um, yeah, boy. I, I mean, I guess, you know, the, the thing for me really was just the fact that they needed to tell their story. And it's, you know, it, it, and all, I mean, okay. I, always, I, always, I always, like, use the example, you know, you're a mother, right? And when you were going through your pregnancy, you, you, you want to talk about it. Something really mystical and interesting was happening mm. to you. And it was very, you know, sacred and specific to you. And, you know, imagine, you know, no one asks you about being pregnant, right? And here mm. you are doing something that's amazing and, and going through this experience. Um, everybody who's gone through some sort of tra trauma, some sort of experience, whether it's positive or negative, needs to uh, find a way to get it out, I right. think. Yeah. Right, right, channeling. To channel it. And that's, yeah. that's, you know, so these women were very happy to want to talk to us and do these interviews, and, and that, was the, that was the spark that I, I, mm. I recognized, and the, the need for storytelling as a way to heal. Well, there we go. We go back to the concept and the need for storytelling. Absolutely. And, and that is so important. So when we come back after a quick break, we're going to talk about how you threaded this into your storytelling. It's really fascinating to see somebody with such a rich experience and throwing it into your own creative product. So come back. We're going to talk about rated stories. Are you looking to get shrunk? Join us on Shrink Wrap 
Hawaii. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I see couples, individuals, families, because you know why? Because we all have problems. And if you're curious about shrinks and what they talk about, come look at my show, Shrink Wrap Hawaii, and maybe you'll find your shrink. Hello, I'm Dean Nelson, host of Planet of the Courageous. From a Tibetan point of view, we chose to be on this planet because we enrolled in a sort of graduate school for courage. Just that we may have chosen this adventure is a leap of logic. The question is, how do we spend and make sense of this precious human life? We are, as a species, extraordinarily successful, dominating the planet, and now with planetary-sized problems that our existence itself has created. It takes courage to face not only the uncertainty of life, but also the challenge of sustaining the gift of life for future generations. Join us every other Monday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Back here on Quok Talk, I'm Crystal talking to Braden Yoder about the creative channeling of not necessarily traumatic, but something so deeply felt and to let it kind of translate and, and channel into creative processes. And Braden's just working on a, uh, a really interesting story, but you have so many projects. Let's go and specifically talk about the one that you have that's relevant to your experience with the sex trades and uh, that. You sure. Talk a little bit? Um, well, can I talk about my thesis film first sure. and how that, that experience informed it? So um, the film that I ended up taking back from India, Breakdown, uh, in 2013, was shot in the in the in the old city of Pune, and the, the all of the research and all of the time I spent there really informed the characters there that that we, we um, that we created. So in that story, a American who knows nothing about that culture ends up, you know, f Good. falling into this old city where nobody speaks English, you know, except a couple different people, mm. and he ends up like the old film noirs taking a misstep and slowly tightening the noose around his own neck be because of his lack of understanding of the local culture, uh -huh. right? And the, the, the opposite for him is, is the heroine or the, the anti-heroine is a dance um, bar girl who has been trafficked. And um, for her, she's looking for agency, right? Mm -hmm. the, the film's really about power. And thinking about power and how those kinds of things, those relationships work in, in that world has been on my mind ever since, you know, to see how these men could dominate these, you know, these women. In some cases, these grandmothers who were dominating th these women, right? As I said, um, it's it's just an interesting. I mean, interesting. It's tragic, but it's it's really a fascinating look at, at human behavior. So, you know, having that experience and then taking coming home, I started to think about trafficking, as I said, in this hmm. in this country, and um, I didn't really know it existed. So I started reading, right. and then the more reading you do, the more you look at YouTube. Um, people test you know, these testimonials. You find that the story is pretty much the same all around the world. You know, the, the faces are different, but right. the story is the same. And, and was the, the, the actress in your film, or she is a? She was she was an actress uh, f from uh, Maharashtra, um, mm. a, a native uh, Maharashtrian um, Marathi girl, right. and she loved it. You know, and she was able to bring her own experiences to. I mean, and that's the thing about film too is, even though I can create the overall you know apparatus. Yeah. Um, you know, the actors are going to come and bring their own thing, too. Oh, the cinematographer is going to bring their own thing, too. And that's what I love about it, you know. So in that case, she was from the local culture herself. So as far as I could get with the local culture, she could get the rest of the way because of having grown up in it. And so um, my current project, then, the one that I took to the producer's lab, is called White Indians. And the story follows a traffic Navajo girl who leads a broken army vet on a healing journey home, takes him away from Las Vegas, and ends up taking him... Um, on a healing journey to the Navajo Nation in, mm. uh, in New Mexico and Arizona. And the story there, she's the, she's really her story, she's the heroine. But it was a way to look at the links for trauma between two characters and a way to talk about the need to be able to tell your story and that the road to healing really runs through other people. You know, you go through a traumatic experience and you want to withdraw maybe and just be by yourself. Right. But really the, the way to do it is, is through other people and, and the Navajo I have a lot of respect for it. I went out there, I have a co-producer who's Navajo who's been involved with, it, with me from the beginning on this. Um, and they're a very ceremonial culture. Right. They actually have ceremonies for every major thing huh. in, in life, including coming back from war. There's, there's a, wow. a PTSD uh, story, I mean, a ceremony rather, huh. to help people 
process that. And the idea well, it's that interesting that they acknowledge the implications of this trauma, which is something that is not supported enough. I guess I, I hear as the criticism with the U.S. is all the soldiers coming home is this, where's all the post treatment or support, you know? Yeah, well, I think the, the problem is, you know, you go off and you experience this traumatic thing collectively right. as part of a tribe, as part of this, you know, platoon or, or company of, of soldiers. And then you come back, though, and you get out and you're on your own. Right. Right. And so what I really admire about Native cultures is just that tribal, we're all in it together, w way to look at it. And, and that's what um, the holly guy, the, the soldier in the, in, the, in the film is missing, the, the vet. And that's what uh, Joni, the heroine, ends up rediscovering as, as well. So, so she's been trafficked, she's been cut off from her tribe, and as she finds her way back to her tribe, um, she takes him along and, and helps him understand that, as I said, the road to healing runs through other people. Is there an underlying statement that you want to address that, that there is a lack of us um, seeking help from people on, in the spiritual way or somebody who, who's there for you but you don't want to embrace that? You know, there's something there? Well, I think for, for me, the most important thing, as I said, is, is learning to tell your story. But a story doesn't exist unless there's an audience, you know, for it, right? And so if people don't know how to ask you about your, your story and to be present to, to your own experience, then it's like you might as well not even tell, tell that story, right? Mm -hmm. Like the story, it's almost a story didn't ex exist, like a tree that fell in the forest and nobody heard it, right? I think being, being you know, sensitive to other people's experience and being able to share those experiences is very, very important, whether you're you know, a soldier or whether you're a stay-at-home mom, you know, like everybody has something to tell and they want to be able to get it off of their, their, their chest and, and, and know that somebody acknowledges it. I think that's So important. in the characters in this uh, film project, yeah. the main character, what is his name again? Cam. Cam, and the main heroine is Joni. Joni. So does Cam, does he stem from experiences of, of close friends of yours? I mean, where did his character come from and how, how does he see the sex trafficked woman? I mean, is he somebody that represents our bigger view or judgmental view of what a prostitute is, you know, what her world is? Yeah, absolutely, partly. Plus she's yeah. an underage, underage ah, uh, okay. girl, so of course he, he doesn't look at her that he can learn anything from her. Right. Um, and he's an amalgam of a lot of guys that I knew who came back and had difficulties uh, uh, readjusting. Yeah. And Do you think it's a guy thing to not be able to confront your feelings? I mean, of course you have the PTSD, but yeah, in absolutely. addition I mean, to that, I mean, I'll just right? speak for myself. Like I said, like, I didn't ever think that this was something that was important. And w when I went on to teach creative writing, um, for a few uh, summers and, and a semester, yeah. you find that the, the, the girls are always much more ready to talk and ready to write. Right. And the boys have to have it, you know, <laughs> dragged out of them a little deep, bit. Yeah, yeah you know, and it's, I, I don't know if how that works, but I know that from my own experience, um, I didn't know that this was important until I had gone through it and I needed to find an outlet for myself. And so that's why I said I am an advocate for it now. And so when I do, when I was a teacher, I would challenge the boys in that sense, like as a coach, like the way they needed to be, to, to really be able to get in touch and, and talk How about How would you things. suggest that though? How do you educate somebody, not educate, forget that, how do you get somebody, a, a guy, to get in touch with their feelings and to embrace that conversation? <laughs> Come on, let's get some tips for people out there who have no, like, uh, you know. I don't know, I don't know if I have, <laughs> I don't know if I have any, any um, tips for, for anybody, but I just know in the classroom, you know, as I said, the girls are much more willing to, to journal and, and to do those kind of things. And boys need to be challenged, you know, and if they respect the, the teacher, the male teacher yeah. or, the, or the female teacher. Um, but the way I, I would try to engage them is as the way like a football coach or a you know, basketball coach would engage them and, and, and challenge them to really get it, you know, dig deep and, and, dig and, deep. and go there. Yeah. So women don't need to dig deep necessarily. They always are already I think, digging. I think women are, uh, well, again, I just, I don't want to make yeah, I know, too no generalizations, generalizations but, but still. But I think, in, but in my experience, the girls um, in the classes that I taught were much, much more mature than the boys, obviously. Yeah. We all know that. Sure. that. That happens. That's high school, right? That's high school, but that's just general, I think. Yeah. And, <laughs> boys but, never grow up. But they, they were much more introspective and ready to share these experiences. And I don't know if they were just more sensitive. Um, but if I, if I needed, you know, my best writers were always, always the girls. Yeah. Without a doubt. But going back to your female character in your film, how did you find her character? Did you, did you associate her greatly with your experience in India with the sex traffic? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, you know, like I just said, we did interviews, we did, and these interviews were like two to three hour long interviews and we have transcriptions of these interviews. So taking those interviews, take, looking out at interviews with women here, with girls here who had been trafficked and, and um, um, there's a lot, actually a lot, quite a, a few different um, uh, organizations that are working to end this kind of plague in, in our society. Do you think right. we can end trafficking, seriously? I, I hope so.
I mean, I think that that's the that's the goal. You know, I'd, I'd like to, hmm. to see a world where this doesn't exist anymore. Well, in an ideal world, but in a realistic world, I just don't I don't see that in the near future. But having said that, what is like the second best thing to to support women who are victims of this trade? Other than the education, the sex education, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that, or yeah. I don't know, Crystal. Actually, I'm I'm a little because it's in it's it's in our lives, right? Well, you just said that. You know, it's prevalent in in Hawaii even. Yeah. You know, teenage girls who are just abandoned from whatever reasons are out there susceptible to being victims, and it's just crazy. So how how do we even make these steps to kind of help change this? You know, I'm I'm not sure, and and I wish I had some yeah. kind of answers. But I think to talk again about my white Indians kind of related back to this script. Um, yeah, just the idea that we're all connected. Yeah. Is important, you know, and that that it's not, you know, you know competition that's going to get us there, but but rather cooperation and collaboration, you know. So rather than looking at, you know, turning a blind eye to certain things, I think just knowing that we're all connected is is mm. probably an important um, important way to help make some change. And the fact that you're change. embracing um, two very heavy issues in your film with the trauma and the trafficking, um, it's a hard place to go. And you have to get there if you're going to write it, right? Yeah, well, it was the most honest thing that I could have written at the time. And um, I'm proud of the project, and I hope that we can you know, actually make it into a film. Yeah, so let's talk about your vision now. <laughs> for, for the film? Yeah. Well, so um, we're going to go to the American film market in November, as you know. And so hopefully between now and then, we'll have put together some sort of package that when we go there and we meet different sales agents, we can hopefully you know, get some more conversations going. This is a, uh, you know, it was deliberately written as a low-budget film, so something which in that case means less than a million, but in our case means less than, you know, $400,000, right? Yeah. Um, and we're obviously looking to try to find a, a good actor who can help with the distribution. So anyone part. out there who wants to support this project, what's, what's the title, working Titles, title? The title's White Indians, and the, the metaphor for White Indians comes from a phenomenon in the 17th and 18th and 19th century where were white settlers who were grandfathered into the tribe yeah. never wanted to return to white society. Yeah. They became white Indians. Wow. I mean, so there's so much in your uh, story. I want to wish you the best of luck. Anybody out there supporting, support Braden in this project, thank you so much for sharing. Um, and again, be sensitive to things out there because they might affect you and how you channel it in a creative way is even more important, the healing process. So thanks for enlightening us on that. Thanks for having me. All right. See you next time.